For about as long as we've been on this planet, man's been fascinated with taking flight. Um, in the late 1800s, the United States government decided to put its money where its mouth is and gave the nation's premier scientist over a million dollars to build an airplane. He succeeded in building an airplane and launched it twice into the Potomac. A short while later, two bicycle mechanics built the world's first airplane and took flight. Now, this story illustrates an interesting competition between government subsidies and the free market as the true source of innovation. And the story is also the source of our tonight's real history. In the late 1800s, many Americans were wondering if American entrepreneurs could develop the first airplane. Congress got in the act and determined that maybe we should have a government subsidy to some expert who could help America become the first country that could fly. Professor Samuel Langley was one of the most highly regarded American scientists of the late 1800s. He was an astrophysicist, a renowned astronomer. He was head of the Smithsonian Institution. And so Langley was seen as being the man best able to contribute he received a federal subsidy of over $1 million in today's money. Langley's mission was to develop the first manned aircraft. Once he received the subsidy, he went to work on his theory of aerodynamics. And the theory worked like this. He had a houseboat. He believed that if you catapulted the airplane out of that houseboat, almost like with a big rubber band, and flew it, you had the engine going and then the pilot would be able to take it from there and that would be the successful flight with that system. He invested his money in that system. His first attempt at flight was a disaster. Part of the airplane got entangled in the catapult device. Therefore, the airplane quickly went into the Potomac River. Langley, though, had enough money left to do one more flight. And a few months later, December 8th, 1903, Samuel Langley launched his second flight. His pilot had a compass sewn in on his trousers so that he would be able to guide the aircraft once it was in the air. With this flight, it was launched right out of the catapult. For a brief moment, the engines were going. However, it crashed again into the Potomac. The pilot almost drowned. One of the congressmen said after Langley's failed attempt, you can tell Langley the only thing he ever made fly was government money. The Boston Herald said Langley needed to turn his attention away from flying machines and concentrate on submarines. The New York Times said, it's going to take the experts at least one million years before man will ever be able to fly. Langley had many friends in Congress and he had many scientific friends who also helped him receive the subsidy. Alexander Graham Bell, for example, testified before Congress saying that Langley was the man. The successful experiment he had with a model airplane all suggested that he should receive the federal subsidy after Langley's two failed flights, many of his friends suggested that he would be successful if he received more federal money. Langley was hoping to receive additional help. No more help from the federal government was forthcoming. Langley, it turned out, was not careful in governing the resources that they had at the Smithsonian. One of the people there embezzled 50000 or so dollars, and that money caused some embarrassment for Samuel Langley. However, the same year, almost the same time that Langley received his subsidy, two bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, Orville Wright and Wilver Wright, went out to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. It was isolated, it was lonely, they liked the wind patterns there. And they began some very isolated experiments with flying their own airplane. Now they started with flying kites, they flew some gliders, and after a couple of years, they began to experiment with the idea of putting an engine on an airplane. Now, they gave great attention to detail. They spent a little over $1,000 of their own money. They didn't have much. Orville Wright was a high school dropout. Wilbur Wright was a high school graduate. 
They built their own engine. They had great attention to detail. They needed a lightweight engine. And then also they had wings. They watched birds fly. And they had kind of adjustable wings, what they called wing warping. And they did this in order to capture as close as possible a flying machine that would be able to accomplish flight in the way that a bird could fly. On December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers successfully flew a manned aircraft. Once the Wright brothers had succeeded at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, they moved their operations back to Dayton, Ohio, their hometown and they began successfully flying for greater distances. They perfected the flight. Uh, within one year, for example, they were able to fly five miles at one time. That same year, 1904, they offered their services to the United States government, but the War Department turned them down. The government had already spent, in today's dollars, over $1 million trying to subsidize Samuel Langley. They had two airplanes in the Potomac River to show for their investment. Many simply could not believe that two bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, had accomplished what Samuel Langley and all the experts were not able to accomplish. Therefore, the U.S. government turned down the Wright brothers' By 1905, the Wright brothers were able to fly 25 miles in an airplane. And at this point, it became widely recognized these guys could really fly a plane. It had been accomplished. The Wright brothers believed strongly in the profit motive. That's what was motivating them to do the flight. They wanted to make money because they believed that commercially, you could have much success with an airplane as well as militarily. Samuel Langley was trying to give his gift to humanity, the development of an airplane, and to achieve the fame and recognition that went with it. The problem is that Samuel Langley was working with other people's money to achieve success for himself. Ultimately, the Wright brothers were able to sell the first of several planes to the U.S. government, and the Wright brothers did become wealthy and prominent as the result of selling effective, commercially successful airplanes. What an, uh, a cool story. The two bicycle mechanics beat one of the most renowned scientists in the world to take flight. There are so many lessons which we could take from this story. Um, here's mine, okay? My, mine is this. It's not that the free market is ultimately successful where government subsidies always fail. It's not that government subsidies are incapable of innovation. The free market is, infl is, is unflappable, is, un is unfailable. It's rather that innovation is a series of failures. That's what it is. It stops and starts and then a big breakthrough. And the free market, the chaos of that trial and error, that constant failure, is a better playground from which to have all of those failures because, I think this is Hayek that always said this, no one is capable of having enough knowledge. No one is able to coalesce enough knowledge to be the one guy you can put your hopes in, right? The government put it in the, mo in the country's most renowned scientist. Well, bad choice, bad pick, and they should have known you can't make that choice. Let the chaos of the free market dictate it. It will fail as well. But from that chaos, success will emerge. That's the lesson I take from You know what the lesson I took was? That the New York Times is always wrong <laughs> and has always been left wing, apparently. <laughs> right. That it takes millions of government dollars in order to create these breakthroughs. But, Will, I agree with you that, you know, when you have the chaos of individuals competing against one another, you weed out the bad ideas, you promote the good ideas. And, you know, Matt, I mean, this is what you do for a living in terms of, like, betting on good ideas. Sure. You want to put it, place as many bets as possible. You do. Right. Um, but I, I view this from a point... Let's bring it maybe now back to the 21st century. And I look at like Solyndra, for example, you know, right. solar power. If solar power was wanted, you know, people like me, I've had businesses that didn't work, you know, ideas that failed, books that didn't work. But I, you look at the customer. Is there customers out there that want to buy your product or your service? And you, and you build that product based on customer demand. When it comes to the government, they push ideas. They have an idea that, you know what, we're going to create this solar energy and then you're going to want it right when private free market says you know what we're going to give people customers what they want don't create something first and say let's hope that they want solar energy when really people don't want it I so do, i think that's a big difference i do think you know when, when the narrator talked about using government money versus your own money you know i have an entrepreneur in my family and so i see this very very closely on a regular basis there's a discipline that comes with with having to get that, with having to get those funds, with using your own funds. And I do think that that 
intensifies the pressure a little bit. And I think that, Will, to your point about how it's a series and iterations of failures, yes, that's true. But if you think that there's always the possibility of Uncle Sam, for, in, for example, in the case of a Solyndra or some other you know, corporation that's selling things at a loss, by the way, which is what Solyndra was doing, you're less likely to make those very important, very necessary short-term decisions, and there's just less of a, of, a, of a process of, you know, sort of formation of ideas that have to completely stand on their own all the time. You have to make sure you're correct at every juncture. Failure is much more acute when Uncle Sam's not standing over your shoulder and writing you a check. And when the free market is developing itself, it's reacting, like you said, to demand. And so when the government is trying to push something, um, it is more likely to fail, especially if it's something that people don't want. And I think if you look at, for example, half of Obama's platform for the next four years, it's about investment in green energy. And why does he think that people couldn't develop that themselves? And we invented a car by ourselves. Clearly, we in invented a, a plane that works better than the government did. So I think it negates a lot of what Obama's trying to run on for the next four years. You know, I've started two businesses. Um, one succeeded, one failed. Um, but both times I did have to use other people's money. And no, that's different than getting government It money, is though. different. It, it is different. Um, but so one could ask this. If the chaos of the free market is the best place to weed out successes and failures, then why can't the government just seed thousands of cylinders, right, and, and accept the fact that some are going to fail? And by the way, they do try that, right? Recognize that there's a failure rate to investment, to innovation, to venture capital. What's wrong with in, in government? Oh, yeah. Hold on, I'm going to answer my own question first. Oh. Uh, lest someone be confused that I didn't know the answer. Um, and the answer to that is because you're using public funds. Yeah. Because you're burning the rate of other people's money. There's that, and then there's also crony capitalism right. and corruption Huge. creeping right. in. And we saw that, of course, with Cylinder. I mean, how many companies get venture capital of nearly half a billion, or over, rather, half a billion dollars? I mean, I would think most business people would say, a half a billion dollars just to explore it? To idea. fail, yeah. uh, to yeah. fail, right. to fail miserably after government. getting a half a billion dollars. That's what's so amazing. How many companies, Matt, do you know of off the top of your head? If you said, you know, we're going to give you $500 million, just take that and run with it, they wouldn't go <laughs> out of insane. business in oh, no, a yeah. year, 18 but, months? That quickly. But again, you're pushing a product that nobody wants. I'd have wants. the biggest level you, in the world. <laughs> I, you know, I'm anti-big government, but I still think you do need the government to, you know, to give money to some of these innovators, these innovations like, that are out there. The Department of Defense is, you know, constantly exactly. working. For example, like, you could use it as a price system. New Gingrich used to talk about this all the time. If you were to take 10%, for example, of NASA's budget, which is $18 billion, it's $2 billion you can use to give to a prize. So the first person to get to Mars or the first person to, you know, build, build a space people, station, not that would be a prize. Yes. Be careful, you create distortions that way as well. Oh. Uh, but stay tuned, because right after this, we're going to have tonight's Island of Misfit Stories. <laughs>